Barak Mar, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Welcome, everyone, once again to Oroho the Way. And today we have a wonderful presentation on the Syriac icons of the liturgical year by His Eminence Dr. Mar Severius Roger Akrash. And the presentation is focusing on the liturgical year of the Syriac Orthodox Church, its divisions, and a survey of various manuscripts and archives of the Syriac icons, and an overview of a few images from the Nativity, the first cycle, the Annunciation Nativity cycle. And after the presentation, you will have the opportunity to interact with our beloved Sedna. So you can ask questions, you can make comments, you can put your comments in the or questions in the comment section of whatever the um, social media platform you're watching this. And as announced, this session is hosted in connection with the Syriac Orthodox Icon Exhibition at St. Ignatius Mission Chapel under the St. Ignatius Cathedral, Dallas, Texas. The Icon Exhibition is on Saturday, October 15, 2022. And I will share more details about the Icon Exhibition towards the end of this program. So let me introduce our beloved Shaidna the presenter and the resource person for today. More severius Roger Akrash, as you know, the Archbishop Patriarchal Vicar for the Syriac Studies. He received bachelor's in theology and philosophy from the Catholic University in Paris, then master's degree in theology from the University of Holy Spirit in, in Lebanon, and PhD in theology with high distinction from the Catholic University in Paris. And he teaches Bible studies, sacraments of the church. He is a spiritual guide and vice rector to this seminary, uh, Marat Saidna, um, since 2005. And he also teaches patristics in various universities. And our beloved patriarch appointed him as a director of the Department of Syriac Studies in 2015. And since then, he is serving as the director of the Department of Syriac Studies. And uh, now he is the Patriarchal Vigar uh, for the Syriac Patriarchate Department of Syriac Studies. He's also serving as the editor of the Patriarchal Journal with that brief introduction. Um, and uh, he also published a lot of books, you know, um, and one of the thing that connects with today's session is the publication of the icons, the Syriac icons. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But with that brief introduction, let me welcome our beloved Shaidna to Urahodave on this presentation, Syriac Icons of the Liturgical Year. Barak Morshedna. Thank you, Father Ranjan. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you again, a second time after our first talk about the Patriarchal Library. And thank you again for the presentation. Uh, I would like to stress that I had all, also finished my studies first at uh, St. Ephraim, Theological Seminary in Marat Saidnaya, uh, of which I am very proud. I have finished my Syriac studies and theological studies before uh, continuing my studies uh, abroad in Paris and in uh, Lebanon. So our talk for today is uh, about the Syriac icons of the liturgical year. Uh, this, uh, let's say, topic was chosen because uh, Three years uh, earlier, or th before three years, we've published in the Department of Syriac Studies a set of 100 icons for the liturgical year. So today I am presenting uh, this set of icons and the liturgical year in general. I will give you an idea of the plan of our talk. So for today we'll speak a little bit about the Department of Syriac Studies, the idea of the project of publishing 100 icons for the liturgical year, and uh, then exposing what is the liturgical year in the Syriac liturgy, uh, and give a survey of the manuscripts, nine manuscripts used in this set of icons, and at the end giving samples of images from the nativity cycle. So first, the Department of uh, Syriac Studies was created, as mentioned by you, Father uh, Ranjan, 
in 2015 by His Holiness Moran Morgatius Afrem uh, II. Uh, it was created to be responsible for the cultural activities of the Patriarchate. So everything related to manuscripts, to publications, uh, the Patriarchal Journal, uh, even the Patriarchal Library, also to organize the Patriarchal Library, uh, to digitize manuscripts, to catalog them, uh, and to work on a website for uh, the Department of Syriac Studies where you can find many resources. So the website is working now on dss-syriacpatriarchate.org. We are we have finished digitizing the manuscripts of the Patriarchate. The nuns are working with us in that. Uh, we've digitized also manuscripts in Iraq, Mormatta, in Germany, and we're, we are working on other collection of manuscripts. And uh, at the same time, as, as I said, we are concerned also with uh, publications. So one of our projects was to publish uh, a set of icons to be used uh, in the churches, in uh, catechism, uh, by uh, the teachers of uh, Christian uh, education in our churches or our Christian centers. The idea came for us from uh, an initiative made already by uh, Father Abdu Badawi, a Maronite priest who already published for the Maronite church icons for the liturgical year. Why the liturgical year? Because most of our icons in our Syriac traditions are uh, found in Gospels, what we call lectionaries. So Gospels uh, divided for the readings for the whole year, for the whole liturgical year. And between the texts of uh, readings, we find icons depicting the scenes that are uh, in the Gospels. So we'll find from the beginning of the Gospels, the Annunciation to Zechariah, the Annunciation to the Virgin, the Visitation, etc., up to the Feast of the Holy Cross. We'll find for every, let's say, major feast or uh, text, uh, an icon in the illuminated manuscripts, what we call illuminated manuscripts, so manuscripts with images, with icons. So Father Abdu Badawi already produced uh, icons for the liturgical year in a new style inspired by the old icons of uh, the Syriac tradition. And because all of these icons of the Syriac tradition, or let's say the vast majority of them are found in Syriac Orthodox uh, manuscripts, we found it uh, very um, uh, let's say, useful to publish again the same icons in a big size, so to make them again available to the faithful, to be able to see them, but in a big size to be exhibited in churches, in centers, in, uh, as I said, in classes of catechism. So if we, we produced 100, we, chose, we have chosen 100 uh, of these icons, publish them in a format of uh, 30, uh, centimeter 46 so 30 by 46 uh, centimeters you can see here the box of these icons and one of them the virgin mary of which i will talk a little bit later here here you can see also these icons under them we've written what is the theme or the title of the icon in three languages in syriac in english and in arabic and we've mentioned the source, the origin of the icon, what, where it is found today, in which library, in which museum, uh, the folio, so the page of uh, this icon in that book, and the year in which the icon was painted. You can see again another, um, let's say, picture of this box of 100 icons produced by the Department of Syriac studies. Let me talk a little bit about the liturgical year uh, in the Syriac tradition. The liturgical year in our Syriac tradition is divided into, let's say, five major uh, cycles. It begins uh, 
actually uh, very soon in uh, the end of October or beginning of uh, November with the nativity cycle, eight Sundays that precede the nativity uh, feast. We begin with sanctification of the church, Hudoshaito, renewal of the church, Hudoshaito, annunciation to Zechariah, annunciation to the Virgin, a visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, nativity of John the Baptist, Joseph's revelation, and the Sunday before Christmas. So for these feasts, we will find illuminations or paintings in the uh, lectionaries, in the illuminated Gospels. The second uh, cycle that follow is the cycle of Epiphany. So the eight uh, Sundays that follow the feast of baptism of our Lord. The first six Sundays are named uh, simply first Sunday after Epiphany to the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. And the seventh is the Sunday of the priests, departed priests, and the eighth is the Sunday of the departed. And here we will find some, let's say, uh, icons about Christ uh, preaching to his disciples, uh, John the Baptist also preaching, the decollation of John the Baptist, the martyr of uh, uh, Saint Stephen. So events that are included in this cycle of Epiphany. And following the third cycle, the cycle of uh, the Great Lent. And here we have mostly the miracles made by our Lord. And for each miracle, we will have its own painting in these Gospels. The wedding at Cana, the leper, uh, the paralytic, the Canaanite woman, the Good Samaritan. So here we have a parable instead of a healing. And then again, a healing the blind and the entrance into the Holy Week with the Hosanna Sunday and the Holy Week of which we will have many icons in the Gospels depicting all the events, uh, the, arrest, uh, the let's say, uh, Christ in before uh, Hanan or uh, Kaif uh, and the, the, let's say, the Holy Thursday or Good Friday and until the resurrection. After the cycle of Lent come comes the cycle of the resurrection. And here we have uh, about three cycles for the resurrection, according to Van Kitho, where we have the former Sundays, the middle Sundays, and the latter Sundays, divided into eight, eight, eight Sundays, each uh, cycle of them. And of course, before that, we have the Easter octave, the eight days that follow Easter, between Easter and the new Sunday. And in the lectionaries, we have a different, a little bit different division. It divides the readings into Sundays after the resurrection and nine Sundays after the Pentecost. And then we have the Feast of Transfiguration with two Sundays and Assumption followed by five Sundays. And we have for these feasts as well, uh, image, uh, made special, especially for the Transfiguration, let's say, for uh, St. Peter and St. Paul, for the Assumption, uh, etc. At the end, uh, the fifth Sunday is the cycle of the cross, in which we are now currently in our liturgical year, and uh, it includes uh, seven general Sundays after the Feast of the Holy Cross, uh, the finding or the discovery of the cross with the image of St. Constantine and Helen. This is, in general, the division of the liturgical year for which there are intellectionaries icons dedicated to these uh, feasts. So you can see that most of the icons that we find in the Syriac tradition concern scenes uh, that are told in the Bibles. We have very few uh, scenes or elements coming from the Apocrypha or the extra Bible uh, let's say, tradition. We have, for example, the Dormition of the Mother of God, or what the Catholic called the Assumption. So uh, for this scene, yes, we are talking here about the tradition of the Church, not about the Gospel, but very few, like also Constantine and Helen. 
Now, uh, I give an idea about the manuscripts used in our uh, uh, set of uh, icons, the 100 icons for the liturgical year. We have used uh, nine manuscripts. So the first one we've used, and it is one of the oldest manuscripts containing images in the Syriac tradition and even in the whole Christian church, is the Rabula Gospels, dating back to the year 586. The Rabula Gospels is named after the name of Rabula, the copyist of uh, the text of this manuscript. The manuscript was copied uh, in a region not far from Aleppo, in, uh, Zug, in their Zughba. And there uh, it was copied uh, for the use of the monastery. This manuscript was kept by the Syriac church, and then it passed to the Maronite church in the Middle Ages, in, in the 11th or 12th century. And from the Maronite church, it was taken to Florence, in Italy, where it is uh, today. So we can see here the Virgin Mary in this uh, gospel holding uh, our Lord in her hands. Another uh, gospel or lectionary that we used is the Syriac Orthodox Patriarchate 353, the number of this manuscript, or known also by Damascus 12 over 8. This manuscript is dated to the year 1055. It contains uh, only a few images, but it is a very luxurious uh, manuscript, rich in ornamentation, but as images, it contains only a few. And one of the famous uh, images of this manuscript is the Virgin Mary, what we call the advocate, because in this manuscript, you can see it is written around the Mary, uh, Yoldathaloho, or Mater Teu, Mother of God in Greek, and on, uh, let's say, on the, the paper that she ha holds, we have this inscription in Syriac, my soul uh, exalts uh, and praises the Lord. So the Magnifica of uh, the Virgin, and a prayer in Greek in which the Virgin asked for God to be mercy over the mortals. And this icon is very special because it exists also in the Byzantine tradition, but the Syriac type is older than the Byzantine uh, examples that we know uh, today. These are the same examples in the Syriac, uh, in the Byzantine tradition, one of them is found in Cyprus, and uh, you can see them, the same model, the Virgin Mary who is interceding for the sinners. A third manuscript, Church of the Forty Martyrs in Mardin, a manuscript from the 11th to 12th century, and uh, here you can see the Pentecost in this manuscript. Uh, the blue background is very, uh, let's say, peculiar to a number of our manuscripts, and you can see he here it is used. To give another example, the British Library manuscript, uh, it's number 7170. It is dated to 1216-1220. It is a manuscript produced uh, originally in uh, Iraq, in St. Matthew uh, Mormatai Monastery. And this manuscript is very rich in uh, illuminations. It contains uh, a big number, maybe one of the most, let's say, rich manuscripts in uh, images. And here you can see a unique image used for the consecration or the sanctification of the church. So a bishop with a priest holding the censer and sensing the bishop and the altar. You can see the liturgical fans and uh, uh, the Corbone, the gifts on the altar. Another manuscript, Vatican Syriac 559, so a manuscript kept in the uh, Vatican today. It is dated 
1220. This manuscript was originally made in Iraq also in Mosul. Both manuscript, this one and the previous one, you can see that the background is full with a color, even a blue or here, as you can see, it is something like a little bit red. Here we have the revelation to Joseph. Joseph is sleeping and dreaming. You can see that this manuscript, the ornamentation that are in this manuscript resemble a little bit the, let's say, the context of Mosul and uh, the architecture uh, and uh, the vestments in Mosul in the uh, 13th century. So even the bed on which Joseph uh, sleeps, it resembles the beds of that time in that period, in that context. I mean. uh, also the manuscript Syriac Orthodox Patriarchate 348, uh, a manuscript kept in the Patriarchate. Here we can uh, see the women who are coming to the tomb at the uh, resurrection to see the angel there. This manuscript date to 1222, 13th century. Another manuscript of Midyat, Midyat, so uh, in Turkey, in Tur Abdin, uh, kept in the bishopric, uh, Syriac Orthodox bishopric in Tur Abdin. Uh, the manuscript was made for the church of Morsobo in Hach and dated 1227. In this manuscript, we have some original uh, images, such as the temptation of Christ, which uh, it is a sole example in this manuscript. You don't find it in another manuscript. You can see Christ and the devil uh, in front of him. Another image of this manuscript, for example, the uh, Pentecost. You can see the difference between this image and the previous one we've seen in a manuscript of the Church of the Forty Martyrs. Uh, another manuscript from uh, the Church of the Forty Martyrs in Mardin, uh, number 38, also from the 13th century, 1229, and here also a unique image of the Canaanite woman who came to intercede for her daughter. Also, it is a sole example of this uh, miracle. Another manuscript, very important, uh, Church of the Forty Martyrs in Mardin 41. It is called the Lectionary of Dioscorus uh, because it was uh, made by a bishop named Dioscorus and uh, it contains original paintings that we cannot find in another gospel, such as Christ who is praying in Gethsemane. You can see it on this image. This manuscript was saved during the wars. It was uh, thrown in a uh, well, and that's why some of uh, its images are damaged, but it, it was later uh, saved and uh, uh, pulled out and uh, used again in churches. It is in Mardin today. In this same manuscript, you can see the image of Christ giving the communion uh, to the disciples. And you can see how the disciples are coming, opening the hands in the form of a cross to take the communion according to the old custom of taking the communion in hands. Another uh, third point in our presentation, some samples of the nativity cycle. I go fast for these examples. Just I want to show you some examples. For example, here the Annunciation to Zechariah. You can see Zechariah in the temple with the angel in front of him, Zechariah holding the censer. And another model of this icon in the Gospel of Hach, Zechariah sitting and wondering about uh, what the angel is telling him. Uh, the Virgin Mary, the second scene is the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary. Mary. We can find uh, something particular to the Syriac icons, I think, this image of uh, Mary at the well, because in some uh, gospels or apocryphal uh, gospel, Mary received the angel while she was at the well. So we find the well in some of our depictions as here and 
like we find it in another image very old found in Syria, we can speak about it later, in the city of Dura Oropus. Uh, these paintings found in Dura Oropus wall paintings are maybe of the oldest in the Christian, uh, uh, let's say, history. And one of them is Mary uh, on the well, receiving the angel. Another one, also Mary on the well, receiving the angel, you can find it. So the well itself is sometimes a symbol of Christ, sometimes a symbol of Mary, who contained the water of life. Here, the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, you can see, for example, I give just one idea about this image. You can see uh, Elizabeth is on the right side and behind her, it is a little bit dark and Mary on the left side and uh, let's say behind her, we can see a light. So uh, because Elizabeth was a symbol of the night of uh, the day that ended, the Old Testament that ended, and a new day came with Mary. You can see it here with the light behind her. Here, another image of Mary visiting uh, Elizabeth. We have only these two examples of the visitation. Nativity of John the Baptist. Nativity of John the Baptist, you can see here uh, this model uh, of Mosul with the people and their vestments that resemble uh, a lot the vestment of the people of the Arabs living in uh, Mosul in the 13th century. And even in iconography, in the Arabic iconography, you can find uh, parallels to these uh, icons. I can show you here, for example, an Arabic uh, philosopher teaching his disciples uh, in the same way that we've seen with Zechariah sitting and talking to uh, the Jews who came to ask him about the name of the child. You can see here Zachari Zachariah and the Jews, and here again, the Arabic philosopher with his disciples. I thank you for your attention. I hope I was not very late in my uh, presentation, and now I am ready to receive your uh, questions. Um, thank you, Sayyidina, for this wonderful presentation. One of the things that you are trying to emphasize is the seven cycles. If you are not following the cycles of the the church, the liturgical year, you are lost in in, in, in you are partially lost because you know, as you mentioned, um, the cycles are connected to the Holy Bible. You know, it's most of the. Sundays are arranged in such a fashion that, you know, it, it relates to the Christ events, some Christological events. Exceptions are like, you know, the Dormation of Virgin Mary, and there are a few exceptions as well. Mm -hmm. but, um, if you're not following the cycle, the liturgical cycle, the seven cycles, you are in some way lost. And um, one way to promote and, you know, bring back the attention of um, the faithful is to emphasize on icons like you know you can um organize these icons and you know so uh, um you know if the churches can uh, procure these icons they can arrange in such a fashion that you know these are the icons of this season and this is the season um this is the sunday of you know this icon is belongs to this sunday and things like that that kind of a visual gospel will also help and uh, thank you so much for publishing these icons so that you know even churches can buy and you know they can procure it from you from the department of syriac studies uh, so i have few questions sometimes um these seven cycles are kind of confusing um, mm -hmm. um especially uh, one of the books that was available in in india is by more chrysostom or uh, moses uh, uh, salama and oh. the the division is slightly different than the divisions that you presented and you know we also follow a different um division i i mean you know mm -hmm. sometimes we call the first season as the season of annunciation and you called it season of uh, nativity mm -hmm. yeah i mean you know uh, so yeah it's a difference you... in appellation not a big difference but true we can find differences in cycles especially 
between the east, I mean Iraq, the Mafriyanate, and what we call the eastern uh, liturgy, and the west, the western liturgy of uh, Antioch. There was a difference, uh, really a substantial difference in cycles and divisions between the east and the west in our history. But nowadays, mostly we are following the western uh, divisions. Right, right. Yeah, is there any reference? That was my question, like, you know, mm. so... Um... The references, uh, I made a difference, if Abuna, uh, you've uh, noticed, I made a difference between the Fanqiyotho and the lectionaries. If we follow the lectionaries, the lectionaries give a different division, especially for the Sundays following uh, the resurrection, Easter. Right. And the uh, lectionaries are, are older than the Fanqiyotho in this regard. Hmm. So the Fanqiyotho, when we organized our liturgical year into cycles of eight Sundays, which happened at the turning of the first millennium and the second millennium, so yani, at the year 1000, let's say, uh, about the year 1000, we made all our cycles into eight Sundays. But before that, it wasn't strictly into eight Sundays. As you, as you can notice, for example, from the uh, cycles after the resurrection. We had, let's say, seven Sundays after the Pentecost and then nine Sundays, nine Sundays after the Pentecost. So we didn't, we, was, we weren't really uh, concerned to have always the eight days uh, or eight Sundays after a major feast. So the model of eight Sundays entered uh, with the eight tones and uh, all of that, the, this organization is a little bit uh, posterior to uh, the first divisions that we find in the lectionaries. Right, right. And that's a, a very good piece of information because, you know, many times people will get confused. Even some, mm -hmm. uh, some priests trying to preach this, they will get confused. The Sunday school teachers will get confused. So now, you know, it makes sense, like, you know, how you are trying to uh, streamline everything to eight Sundays, um, mm. you know, during what and during each cycle. Oh, that's a beautiful mm. way of looking at that. I think you know, um, the lectionary in Malankaran also need to be revised uh, to follow this. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, thank you, Saidna. Now I have a question for you. I have a lot of questions. Uh, I, I'm seeing that many people are commenting as well. So. Um, the Syriac Orthodox Church, or, you know, sometimes we may get confused with the second commandment, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, forbids idol worship. Uh, mm -hmm. And we as Orthodox Christians know that, you know, it's not forbidding, like, you know, it's not about icons. So mm -hmm. how do we approach this? You know, and how can we convincingly say that iconography is not a violation of second commandment? Yes. Uh, when you speak about the second commandment, so it is in the book of Exodus, chapter uh, 20, uh, where we read, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or uh, that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So here uh, God is preventing or is uh, uh, telling Moses should not make an idol to venerate or to worship, as it happened in the chapter 32 in the uh, book of uh, Exodus, where they worshiped the calf in the Old Testament. So uh, this doesn't apply on the icons, because everywhere we stress that we do not worship uh, the icon or the wood or the material made by the icon. Uh, the idols were worshipped as such, the wood or the stones that were made by people, these are the idols, and they were worshipped as such. But in our Christian tradition, we uh, venerate the sign, we respect them, we venerate, like we venerate the sign of the cross on which our Lord was crucified. So we venerate the sign, but we do not worship the material, but we worship the crucified. 
and we venerate the saints through their icons. So mostly, as you have seen in our tradition, the icons concern Christ and the events in the uh, Gospels, most of them. Of course, we have icons or images of saints, but we do not uh, worship. There is a big difference between worship and veneration. We do not worship the saints nor their icons. Only we venerate the icons and we worship the Lord. Right. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sedna, for that. Um, and you mentioned, like, you know, our tradition. Like, do we have, I mean, you know, one of these songs that we uh, use during the, I mean, you know, on Midland, um, mm -hmm. you know, it talks about King Abgar. So yes. that was maybe probably the, the, the earliest reference in the Christendom mm -hmm. about, yes. I think, like, you know, the song goes like this, O Abgar, when all had seen the wonders of Christ, you believe without seeing him. And uh, so you were given the precious image of our Lord, and by it, your affliction was healed wondrous. Um, yes. O Abgar, you faith in, your faith in Christ was most beautiful. You believed without seeing him, only seeing through the icon of Christ. So can you tell me more about and this Christ, um, this event, how King Abgar, a Gentile, maybe the first Gentile who converted to, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, who followed Christ. Yes, the King Abgar uh, was the king of Edessa in the time of our Lord. This is what the tradition uh, tells about him, especially in a book that it is called The Teaching of Adai, preserved in uh, Syriac, and uh, the story says that uh, Abgar sent uh, uh, the uh, person whose name is Hanan to paint uh, the Lord. He, he told him, you will go and invite him to come to Edessa, and I will give him the half of my kingdom. But if he doesn't come, I want to, you to paint him and to bring me his image. So when Abgar went there, and uh, sorry, when Hanan, the painter, went there, and Jesus refused to come with him at that time and promised him to send him one of his disciples. Uh, Hanan tried to paint our Lord and he couldn't. So our Lord finally took uh, so uh, a mandilo and he put it on his face and the, uh, his face was printed on this uh, mandilo. Okay. So, uh, and he, or a veil, or Mandilo a veil, and he took that veil with him to Edessa, that Mandilo, and it was kept in our church in uh, Edessa until uh, the early uh, 7th century in our church in Edessa. At the 7th century, one of our bishops in Edessa refused, whose name was Isaiah, refused to give the communion to the king Heraclius, who was passing by uh, the city of Edessa. And Heraclius, because he was Chalcedonian, Byzantine, and he was refused the communion, he was very angry. So he took the church of Edessa, our church in Edessa, and gave it to the Chalcedonians. And that's how uh, the church passed to the Chalcedonians with uh, the mandilo, the veil, uh, which was in Edessa, and then it traveled, uh, and it is today uh, in Italy. It is kept today uh, in Italy because later with the uh, Crusades, it was taken also by the Latins and put in Italy. So it is one of the oldest, yes, paintings uh, of our Lord. So some, some scholars may have doubts about it, about the originality, about the true is it true or not? But uh, it is in our tradition, and we say it as it, we receive it. Right, and the book that you mentioned, like the the doctrine of Adai, you know, that's a fifth century yes. book, right? Yes, uh, a fifth or sixth century. Yes, in that yeah. uh, written in that time, but it uh, it uh, let's say it talks about events that happened earlier in the time of our Lord and his disciples Adai. So even if you know you you have suspicion about the 
veil that's kept in Italy, this story was there mm. since fifth century or sixth century, right? So that was one of the earliest reference, I guess. Yes, yes, very, very old. Yes, yes, very, very old. We have some, let's say, material old uh, image of our Christ, which is not, sus uh, let's say, suspicious by or not seen as suspicious by anyone. Uh, in Dura Europus that I mentioned earlier, Dura Europus is a city in Syria uh, between Deir Zor and Bukamal in the east of Syria, where they found in 1920, around the 1920s, uh, a complex in which there was the oldest known synagogue in the world with very, very nice paintings and the oldest church, and one of the oldest church, churches, let's say, uh, in which they found many uh, also depictions or images. And one of them was uh, the image of our Lord, uh, the good uh, pastor, who was uh, holding uh, also a, a sheep on his uh, shoulders. Okay. The good shepherd one, so, right? Uh, the good shepherd, so, sorry, mm -hmm. the good shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders. Okay. So it was found in Dura Europus, and it is one of the oldest uh, paintings in the world of our Lord. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Um, uh, um, uh, Sayyidina, like, so the earlier church, mm. I, I know the symbolism of fish was there, uh, in the early church, like, you know, maybe that was a pointer where the Lord's Day is celebrated, where the communion is celebrated. So that may be a kind of symbolism. But uh, did the early church have icons or at least some form of images? Like, do we have any other evidence from the early church? So uh, in, when we speak about Dura Oropus, we are speaking about the third century. Okay. And mm. uh, in some uh, excavations also in Rome, they found images from the third centuries. But because, you know, in the first centuries, the churches were not uh, accepted, uh, the Christians were persecuted. So they didn't have the right to build churches and to make images. And that's why we haven't kept, let's say, uh, substantial uh, examples of uh, images in churches from the first centuries. That's, I, I mean here the second or the third centuries. There are, but not many. But beginning with the fourth century, when the Christianity was accepted by the Roman emperors, beginning with Constantine, yes, uh, we can find from that date and later on uh, many uh, images. Uh, we've mentioned the Gospel of Rabula, 586, so something very uh, old on wall paintings in churches we can find from that period. Okay. Um, uh, Say that, like, is there any evidence that the Syriac Orthodox Church was against uh, icons, like, you know, supported the iconoclasm or the church was um, iconoclast in its nature? Mm -hmm. No, uh, I think there is a misunderstanding with the Byzantine about that. Uh, let's explain it for uh, those who are following us. In the Byzantine tradition, they have seven ecumenical synods. In our tradition, we accept only the first three of them. Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus. So we reject Chal Chalcedon and the following synods of the Byzantine uh, church. Uh, so until the seventh, the seventh uh, synod in the uh, Byzantine tradition, it was about icons. There were people who rejected icons, people who accept icons. They made many synods before that. One synod in 754, they uh, rejected icons in that synod. And then later in 700. 87, they accepted again the icons. So they had a debate, controversies in the Byzantine church about the icons. The Syriacs were not involved in these controversies. But surprisingly, in the seventh synod of the Byzantine church, they mentioned St. Severus and St. Philoxenus as people who were against uh, the icons. 
So St. Philoxenus and Severus lived uh, two centuries before uh, the Synod of Nicaea, uh, the second Synod of Nicaea in the Byzantine Church. But they were accused by the Seventh Synod that they were against uh, the icons or iconoclasts. But the truth is that what they mentioned about them is not really showing that these saints were against the icons. For example, they were uh, quoting a life uh, written about St. Severus, written by his opponents. So a very negative uh, point of view about St. Severus' life. And they mentioned that in one of his sermons, he mentioned that the angels should not be uh, painted with purple as they were uh, painted uh, in his times. So he was criticizing uh, painting uh, angels in general, according to the Byzantine. But fortunately, this, for example, this sermon of St. Severus is preserved until today in Syriac and is translated. And if one reads it, he finds nothing uh, negative about icons. He just is St. Severus is criticizing those who paint the angels in like uh, kings with uh, red or purple and giving them a staff in their hands, etc., giving them power and authority like uh, kings or uh, uh, let's say princes. So uh, St. Severus was saying that they should be depicted in white because they appeared in white, let's say white garments or uh, next to the uh, uh, tomb on the resurrection. So, so he's not against the icons. And even in his conversion, uh, St. Severus, when he was converted and uh, when he received the baptism, one of the things that caused his conversion, his conversion was a painting, uh, a wall painting that he saw in uh, Beirut, in one of the churches in Beirut. And it caused his conversion. It was a painting of, of the paradise. And uh, another thing that St. Severus made in his life, so when he became patriarch, like St. Chrysostom before him, he uh, sold all the objects that were in the patriarchate, uh, like uh, ivory or uh, uh, golden or silver objects in the patriarchate, very let's say, expensive objects, he sold them and gave the money, distributed the money for the poor. So some of the people said that, uh, oh, he was against these objects because they were representing crosses or, uh, I don't know, some objects. So he's uh, against uh, any kind of uh, image, so they thought. But it was not really the purpose. For St. Philoxenus, for example, also, he was criticized because he also uh, removed the Eucharistic doves from his church. What were the Eucharistic doves? They were doves in silver or in gold that were suspended above the altars in which they kept uh, the Eucharistic bread. But in the region of San Severus, we know that uh, the dove was a sacred uh, uh, animal for uh, the pagans. There were... Uh, uh, pagan uh, goddess, uh, Atagaratis, uh, in his region of Mabug, and her symbol was the dove. And to remove this influence of, uh, let's say, of paganism and idolatry from his people, so he removed these kind of doves, especially that the doves uh, were uh, really became uh, very spread in his region and nobody can touch or harm a, a dove because it is a sacred animal. So he removed uh, those doves from his church and that's why he was accused later of uh, being against the icons, which is not true. For example, he explains in one of his books about the Holy Spirit who, was, who appeared like a dove, he said, he didn't become a dove, the Holy Spirit didn't become a dove, but he appeared for the mind of St. John the Baptist like in the form of a dove. So he took a form of a dove, but he wasn't really uh, incarnated as a right. dove. Right. Okay? So these are some of the reasons why uh, Severus and uh, St. Philoxenos 
were wrongly accused of being against the icons right i mean you know so many times we don't understand the context of the writings of church fathers and exactly. you know, we may accuse them without knowing the context in which they they wrote about that uh, so I, I heard of something else like you know um, saint john chrysostom when he was talking about um I mean, this was fifth or sixth century so he, he, during yeah. his sermon on the patriarch uh, when the patriarch of antioch uh, saint Miletius, when he after his death there was a, a sermon by uh, saint john chrysostom and he insisted that people should keep the icon of um the patriarch something like that i'm mm -hmm. not sure about Yes, uh, yes. Details. we have uh, testimonies uh, in history about uh, icons or let's say images of patriarchs kept in monasteries or in churches. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And uh, um, um, Sayyidina, you mentioned like, you know, so one of the beautiful example are, you know, you talked about the symbolism uh, during mm. your presentation uh, while mentioning about the icon of visitation. Like Mary was near the well when you know Angel Gabriel was there, so so the well was right in in between um, Gab, uh, Angel and yes. uh, Virgin Mary, and you talked yes. about the well as the symbol of Christ. Um, yeah. From where the yes. life, I mean the water of life, is you know being mm. produced. Uh, so how do we read? the Syriac icons do we have any specific format and you also mentioned like you know um, angels should not be painted in purple but that was again in a different context like you know so the colors that we use the form of mm -hmm. icons um, the symbolism in icon how do we read how do we approach our Syriac icon so many times our people are misled by the Byzantine influence like you know so they will be looking at uh, certain things, you know, certain aspects, and they um, they may overlook into the real aspects. But you know, uh, I, I don't have anything with the Byzantine icons, like you know. But again, do we have uh, you know what is the systematic way of approaching our icon? How can we read the Syriac icons? Uh, I think one should read them with the gospel first, having read the gospel passage, because there are obvious links with the gospel passage that is uh, told. And second, the church fathers. One sh should read the church father to understand uh, some of these examples. I give the example of the well, if we keep with that example. If we read in St. Ephraim and St. Jacob of Saruk, both will say that Christ is the well, because he is the rock from which uh, the water of life uh, spring in uh, the desert for the people of Israel. And again, Christ is this same rock that St. Paul was mentioning. And on the cross, when he was pierced by the soldier, water came out of him. So he is the rock, he is the well, because the rock in the Old Testament of Moses was also called a well. It was a rock, but it gave water all the time. So springs came out of uh, the rock, and the rock was named also a well. So Saint uh, Ephraim and Saint Jacob will make the link and will say, Christ is the rock, and he is the well as well. And from him came out, on like Moses, when he touched his, uh, the rock with his staff, he pierced, he pierced the rock, and water came out so Christ was also pierced on the cross and uh, water came out then uh, Saint Jacob of Sarug will speak about the Virgin Mary as also a well and here we understand because in the gospel Christ has said in Saint John gospel whoever believes in me also from his uh, from from him will come also uh, springs of water Okay, he was mentioning that to talk about the Holy Spirit. So Mary also received the same title of Christ, the well. And that's how when we see in the image of, let's say, of uh, the Annunciation, we'll find this well. We'll find also, for example, the trees. If we, met, if we go back and see the icons that I put in the presentation, you can find the trees that reminds us 
uh, about the Eden, the paradise. And uh, a lot in the text of St. Ephraim, he makes a lot of links between Eve and uh, Mary and how Eve received the serpent and how Mary received the angel, how Mary uh, was asking about the message and Eve was uh, accepting everything from the devil uh, without asking because it was according to her desires. So uh, you can find a scene of a new paradise that is created in that icon. So you can see all these elements if you read the Church Fathers' uh, writings and you can see them in these uh, images. Thank you, Sayyidina. We have a lot of questions, um, uh, but um, some of the audience are asking, like, why don't our church, uh, why our church is not promoting icons? Uh, maybe from the Indian context, they may be asking, um, yeah. do you think the promotion of iconography would bring a systematic liturgical use of icons? Um, would you mind com commenting on those questions? Yes, yes. Uh, let's... To to speak, let's say, uh, openly about that. We had original icons in our church in the 6th century, as I showed in the G Rabula Gospels. But for then, for three or four centuries, we didn't find in manuscripts icons uh, in lectionaries, until we find again between the 11th and the 13th century. And these icons from the 11th to the 13th century were made uh, let's say, with influence from both the Byzantine tradition and also a little bit from the Islamic art. Okay, we have some Islamic art in the representation that we can find the vestments in the, let's say, uh, the faces of the people that are painted, etc. So we received, uh, in history, what I mean here, that in history we received a lot of influence from other peoples, being the Byzantine or uh, the Islamic art, the Arab art uh, in the Middle Ages. And later, after the 15th or 16th century, we began to receive the Latin influence in all our churches, in India or in our churches. Now you go to Tur Abdin, to Mardin, you will find some modern images in the churches, uh, not icons not Byzantine, not uh, just uh, images from the Latin tradition. So nowadays we, we have like a mixture between uh, our own old heritage and uh, the new uh, paintings from different uh, cultures. Uh, so it is, it, we should ha have a lot of work to do to have our own again, our own tradition, Syriac tradition, I don't mind that we create something new and we should encourage people who have the talents to create something new, to, to read the old, the old uh, images or uh, icons, to read them, being impressed or uh, inspired by them and to create something new that uh, resembles our people and their life today. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Sayyidina. Um, I have a personal confession here. Like, you know, mm. when we try to have more icons in our church, uh, so mm. we looked at the Syriac icons. What happened is like, you know, people were saying these are very basic paintings. Mm. You cannot put yeah. that in the church. Like, you know, aesthetically, you know, our, the Syriac icons are not appealing. And, you know, sometimes, you know, these are in the rudimentary, very crude form, like basic artwork, not mm -hmm. aesthetically appealing compared with the Byzantine ones. So end of the day, what happens is like, you know, we have to replace the Syriac icons with the Byzantine ones. And then we put the Syriac uh, titles right. and things like yes. that, on that you know, try to make it a hybrid one kind of thing. Yes. I don't know whether that approach is good, but uh, and you mentioned, like, you know, the, you know, do you encourage, like, you know, producing new icons? Do you have any advice how to go about that? Like, you know, many people are looking forward to produce more icons. There are many art, artistic people. So how should we approach that? There are initiatives nowadays about, uh, again, creating these kinds of icons. Uh, so we have initiatives made in Sweden 
uh, I have contacts in Germany, also people who are calling uh, upon some artists being uh, Romanian or uh, Polish uh, and asking them to repaint the same models that we have in Mardin or in the lectionaries that I exposed uh, a little bit earlier. So we have some new tentative, but again, we are using uh, some Byzantine uh, painters or uh, icon, let's say, writers, as they, as they like to call them, and to produce our own Syriac tradition. Uh, what I meant today to say that we never were, let's say, original 100%. We always received the influence of uh, the people that surround us. And at some time, maybe the Byzantine, the Armenian, the Arabs. So uh, this, let's say, uh, mixture of cultures is not, uh, and we cannot avoid it. We should do with that. But uh, again, we should encourage if we have original talents in our church or in our, between among our uh, faithful, especially monks and uh, nuns, because these are mostly inspired or maybe more inspired by the liturgy, the church fathers, and can uh, bring something uh, from the, our own spirituality. So the, the way is to, as I said, to, to see all the tradition, which is not a huge tradition, or, let's say all our manuscripts that contain icons may be like uh, we have 50 gospels, 50 lectionaries that contain gospels that are published. We have on our website of the Department of Syriac Studies published most of them. So just to see them, see for example the Annunciation, we will have maybe like 10 models for the Annunciation, to see them, to, to study them, to understand the symbols, the details, then again to write or to paint a, a new icon inspire, being inspired by the details and the theology that is behind the icons. So, I mean, should review our tradition, study it, read the gospel, read the church fathers, and try to bring something new according to the current tradition of today. For example, in India, uh, if they want to paint, it is not necessary to paint like people who looks like uh, the Middle Eastern or the Western, uh, let's say, uh, figures. They can paint something which is particular to their tradition. In culture as well. And yes, in culture, in culturation. Yeah. So, um, so um, if someone is interested in to get trained in Syriac iconography, is there any way they can start with? And you have mentioned the baby steps, like the basic steps. Uh, but you know, is there any any way they can reach out to someone? There are no institutes, I think, who can teach the Syriac uh, iconography. Here in Lebanon, in the Faculty of the Holy Spirit, they have a department for art uh, in which they teach the Maronite iconography, which is inspired by our Syriac tradition. So they can give them some experience about the Maronite, uh, which is influenced by the Syriac tradition. But elsewhere, I don't know. It is about uh, reading some uh, books, some uh, references. Uh, for example, a very important reference in French is the, a book made by Jules Leroy, who went around all the libraries in the West and in the Middle East and photographed all the paintings that he saw in manuscripts, and he described them and explained them in a very uh, important book in two volumes. So just to read the references, about the Syriac icons, and then having the talent, they can start. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, we pray that, you know, um, yes. the next century, I mean, you know, this century will witness more of uh, Syriac uh, Orthodox iconography. Uh, so we have another question, like how can we best use icons as Syriac Orthodox faithful in this century, how would we use them in the church? Um, how would we use them? Uh, yeah, I will. I I would advise to have 
uh, the set that we've made or something uh, similar and to put them in the churches uh, according to the occasion. So, uh, for example, now we are in the cycle of the cross, we can put the image of St. Constantine and Helen or another depiction of the cross in the church to expose it uh, in a corner in the church and we can use it like that in, it's one of the possible uses of these icons to have a corner or a place in the church where we can uh, put the icon of the day in that corner we can use them uh, in uh, the holes when we have like uh, let's say a center or a hall of our church a salon of uh, yeah, the, the whole of the church where the people will gather after the Eucharist on the walls. Sometimes we have different, uh, let's say, paintings. We can put some paintings of our culture uh, in the catechism to explain the faith for the uh, children, for the youth, for the all the categories. We can use the icons uh, in our presentations. If we have uh, PowerPoint presentations, etc., about the faith of the church, etc. We can have examples of these icons. They are freely available, as I said, on our websites. We can use them. So just to give to give always a taste of this uh, tradition. Yeah, even the Sunday school text, they can replace the images with the Syriac icons. Yes, that's yes. one best yes, way. Yes. To... Book, books of catechisms also. Yes. yes. And um, meanwhile, uh, let me mention, like, you know, to see the Suryak Icon Collection on the Department of uh, Suryak Studies website, you know, the link is posted in the comment section. You can just um, go to the Department of Suryak Studies website and, you know, there's a huge collection of Suryak icons. So we are not deprived, we are not in, you know, deprived of icons. So you can see yeah. hundreds of icons uh, from 6th century to the 13th century, I believe. Yes. Um, uh, so, um, Saidna, like I think you know, it's time for us to wrap it up. Like you know, thank you, Dr. Jobin, for asking a lot of questions, at least 10, 12 questions, and we have many other people. Yakov, Alan, Shino, Shinosh. And there are many people who ask questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all those who participate in that. Um, as I mentioned, like you know, this um, um, this program is. I mean, you know, this lecture and uh, this interactive session is organized in connection with the ICON exhibition. Let me mention just a few things about the ICON exhibition. This is going to be uh, from, uh, uh, this is on Saturday, October 15th. So the next month, um, so this will be organized at uh, St. Ignatius Mission Chapel under the St. Ignatius Cathedral in Dallas. So we have on, there are a few more associated events and you can see on friday october 14th uh, so we will have a blessing of new icons and the inauguration by his eminence mortitis eldo and uh, on 15th at 5 p.m we have a session we have a lecture on the image and theology in the Suryak tradition by dr michael winkert so and i believe satan we need to continue these discussions that are um, I mean, you know, so we need to promote two things. One thing is the um, the life cycle of the church, like not the life cycle, but the liturgical cycle of the church. So that need to be emphasized, especially through the icons. So it's a win-win kind of thing. Like, you know, when we talk about the exactly. liturgical cycles and that makes more sense for our people to correlate with the gospel reading, to correlate with the lectionary, the readings on the Sunday, and celebrating the feast at the same time, the visual gospel will help, especially our next generation. So as we mentioned, like we are not deprived of icons. We have a strong, robust tradition of iconography, but unfortunately, we are not talking about that. We need to talk more about the uh, tradition and you know, uh, may God continue to shower all the divine blessings upon you and the Holy Spirit guide and empower you uh, Shaitna, to continue your ministry with the Department of Suryak Studies. Um, thank you. Thank you, again, thank you once again, all the viewers, all those who participated by asking questions. Um, Shaitna, would you mind saying uh, benediction so that we can conclude? 
شما بره قادش وحاضله شرير آمين حوض ضله آبو طيبوث بحذاء بروش أو تفوث مجنونوث دروح قادش وتهو عمك الخون آمين. آمين. Thank you once again.